you. You can hear me. I would like to thank the organizers for allowing me uh, to stand here and give me the opportunity to talk about my favorite topic, which is uh, basic science of fluid therapy. Um, it's a very, very large topic, so we need to focus a bit, and I'll try to focus on the issues that I think will be uh, discussed later. Uh, I will focus on human beings. I will focus on where does the fluid go? What do we know about that, the factors involved? Uh, and I will also focus on the difference between crystalloid and colloid. So there are many subgroups here, as you know, but that would be far too much to talk about today. If we compare the uh, crystalloid and colloids, the first thing we'll see that the colloids have an allergic uh, potential. You would see one allergic reaction out of 500 and one severe in uh, about one out of 2,500. I don't know if, if that's a very important issue in intensive care though, because these patients have high stress uh, levels to begin with. Uh, but the second uh, point that I, I have listed here is the distribution phase for the crystalloids, and that is of very uh, great um, clinical importance. Uh, now the next slide will be um, uh, created in the, something uh, that I called fluid volume kinetics. It's a method that I worked very much with, with it's a kinetic approach where, where which you can uh, pre predict what happens with uh, infusion fluids in the body. And here you see uh, what will happen to the plasma volume if we infuse one liter of Ringer's uh, acetate or lactate and compare that with half a liter of colloid over 15 minutes. So it's a pretty rapid infusion here. And you see that the, um, they um, end up at the, about the same plasma volume expansion. Although, as soon as we turn off the infusion, uh, the uh, volume expansion levels off very, very fast for the ringer's lactate. Well, we think that it's very fast, but it does take some time, actually. If you see here, we end at 15 minutes, and the distribution function ends about here at 45 minutes. So it takes 30 minutes for this fluid to, dis uh, to distribute. And that is uh, a bit of a surprise to me. I thought it was a very, very quick uh, distribution process but it's not, it takes half an, an hour. But when we um, use this clinically, we can ride on this wave of volume expansion all the time. Well, if we take a look in the medical textbooks, we will uh, see something uh, of 20 to 25% plasma volume expansion. That's if we extrapolate this backwards to zero. That is the situation if distribution is immediate, but it's not. So the plasma volume expansion is a lot better and we ride on, on this wave. If we take it continuously during an operation with a continuous infusion, we'll land around 50 to 60% plasma volume expansion of what we have uh, given. Now why so? Why do we have this distribution phase? Could it be the endothelial glycocalyx layer that sort of prevents fluid or makes it difficult for uh, fluid to pass over from the plasma to the interstitium. Um, we, we don't have any study of this, actually we don't have any kinetic study of how fluid behaves with and without shedding of this endothelial layer. Uh, but in my mind this is very unlikely because we know from microcirculatory research that the uh, reflection coefficient, what we call it, is very low for uh, the electrolytes in, 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 this, uh, in these crystalloid fluids, meaning that it would actually pass over very quickly. Uh, no, I think the explanation is a different one. It's uh, known from physiology from the 50s and 60s that the uh, uh, interstitium, the interstitial um, fluid space has a negative pressure, so it holds the tissues together. Without this negative pressure, the interstitial will, will fall apart like this. This a negative pressure makes it difficult to expand. Also, we have elastic fibers in the interstitial uh, uh, fluid space that uh, makes it even more difficult to, uh, uh, for uh, expansion to occur. Without these elastic fibers, what would happen is that when we raise up, actually all the interstitial fluid would run down to our legs, but it doesn't. So, so we understand there must be some, some kind of uh, uh, resistance to uh, expansion. All right, when we have expanded the interstitial fluid space here, you see the volume increases and we have come to a zero situation here. The fluid 
uh, pressure is no longer negative, it becomes positive. That opens up for a lot of flow to pass into the interstitial uh, space. And it uh, will end up something like this. It's an animal study from, uh, from the uh, 90s that I was involved in. It's a, a rabbit heart. Uh, and uh, it was glycine here, but it, it looks the same actually, regardless of, of what flu we give. And here you can see myocardial fibers. You can also see lacuna here of water uh, that sort of tears the tissue apart. And of course, that affects cardiac function. And uh, if we give even more flu to this animal, it will eventually die. Now, can we understand? Uh, in the uh, living human being if this loss of elasticity of the uh, fibers of the interstitial space, if, if that really is the case. Yeah, I, I tried to show that in a study last year using this kinetic model uh, where we infuse fluid in the plasma, it distributes to the interstitium and it comes back to the plasma and becomes excreted here. Um, we can, by kinetic analysis, estimate values of K12, K21, and K10 here, and also the volumes. And if we do that in a large number of patients, large number, 76 males here who uh, received uh, uh, ringus acetate in the conscious state all over 30 minutes, uh, we could see that K21, which is redistribution, it falls exponentially uh, the faster we infuse the fluid. Meaning that we, if we give fluid very slowly, redistribution will occur very fast. So it will essentially only be uh, a volume expansion of the plasma. While if we give it fast, it is pressed into this interstitial fluid space and it will have progressively more difficult to uh, uh, become excreted. So this is an edema mechanism. Right, are there other physiological factors that um, make the body uh, handle fluid differently, or crystal of fluid differently. Yes, first is distribution is temporarily arrested if we have a reduction of the mean arterial pressure, a sudden uh, decrease, like induction of anesthesia is a typical setting for that. And um, uh, it will be um, arrested until the hydrostatic pressure has built up Again, so this can be understood uh, simply from the starling forces. Elimination is reduced during general anesthesia, as my second point. That's a little more difficult to understand. Uh, and uh, I put together here a, a, um, a set of um, uh, studies in the next slide published in the European Journal of Anesthesiology last year. We can see that the half life, the elimination half life of crystalloids in volunteers, conscious. Uh, people, healthy, is, about, is between 20 and 50 minutes, while if we go to general anesthesia, it's at several hundred minutes, so it's about 10 times longer. It's an enormously strong effect of general anesthesia on the elimination of crystal or fluid. And, uh, of course, I've seen this for many years, but I haven't really found out the reason. We have made experiments where we have uh, modulated the adrenergic receptors. Uh, this is uh, during surgery where we have infused low, uh, small doses of uh, esmolol and phenylephrine. It's essentially, that alpha-1 uh, adrenergic receptor should increase urine excretion, while beta-1 receptor should retain fluid in the body. And it can be increased, actually. The urine excretion can be increased, but not nor normalized, because then we will have we would be up here in the ceiling to, to plot an, a normal curve. So that partially helps uh, us, but it doesn't help us all the way. But what is the reason? Uh, I, I tried to elucidate that in a study that was published in Anesthesia and Analgesia beginning of this summer. And it was, uh, again, a kinetic study, a population kinetic study uh, with uh, 78 infusions, both in volunteers and during general anesthesia. And I put in 15 co-factors uh, to see if any of them could explain the reduction of the urinary excretion. Uh, interestingly, it was not general anesthesia per se. It was two factors, there were two factors that s stood out. And the first one was mean arterial pressure. Not the decrease in mean arterial pressure, but the mean arterial pressure as such. And also age. 
Uh, this is a curve, but, but mean arterial pressure was the strongest factor. So here we can plot the plasma volume expansion if we have mean arterial pressure 110 versus 70 millimeters of mercury. Interestingly, the interstitial fluid space will be affected much, much more. So here we have an edema mechanism too. It's not only rapid infusion, it's uh, if we uh, infuse this during a low arterial pressure. Here is a prediction of the urine excretion if you infuse one liter of ring acetate over 30 minutes uh, and what would happen uh, with the diuresis depending on the uh, uh, mean arterial pressure. All right, so this, we have a couple of factors that affect really how the, the crystal fluid distributes and we'll take a little look if we can Take a look in the textbooks here and see if we can find something similar for colloids. Uh, and um, colloids don't have a distribution phase. They look like this, the plasma volume expansion uh, from 20, uh, yeah, 20 milliliters per kilo. You can see that they are uh, an exponential el elimination and a half-life in intervasc intervascular persistence half-life is between two and three hours. Um, if we begin to think then, or do we have any comparison here? We have already talked about the crystalloids, distribution, redistribution, and elimination can be modified. Uh, but what about the colleagues? We know very little about this, as a matter of fact, very, very little. I have seen in volunteers that the intervascular persistence corresponds very closely to the urinary excretion. Uh, but that is in volunteers, and we don't know whether that is the case during surgery or in intensive care. We think that the uh, intervascular persistence is shortened if we have inflammation and we have shedding of the glycocalyx. Uh, we surely know that the albumin leakage increases if we have shedding, but we don't know, uh, we have no kinetic study of whether that uh, spills over to the intervascular persistence of the colloid. Mean arterial pressure, um, not very much known, we just Done, performed a study of hyperoncotic albumin here in Linköp in the Karolinska Solna. Doesn't seem like mean arterial pressure affects the kinetics of uh, hyperoncotic albumin at all. Uh, we have this study, uh, five years old from, uh, from the UK. Uh, this is the only kinetic, uh, or I say, very sparse data, but still it gives you some impression of how fast uh, the plasma volume expansion disappears, and, and from, from these curves, I would say um, it doesn't seem to differ very much from what we know uh, of the uh, uh, intervascular persistence in volunteers. So, mean arterial pressure is probably not very important for colleagues. What about edema? Uh, of course, you know that we have edema from crystalloids, uh, and I already talked about the factors there. Colloids. The only belief we have is that the edema will increase if, if we have uh, shedding or increased capillary leakage, but so, so no firm proof of that. But if we give both together, we surely get a, a greater edema. And, and that's shown in uh, this experimental study from Linköping a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the plasma volume expansion from a colloid. This is 10 milliliters per kilo of... Uh, of um, um, uh, volivin, and if we top two hours after, we top up with a, a Ringer's acetate solution. And it appears that uh, if we compare this to if we, when we infuse them one by one, the elimination of this second one is very, very uh, slow, and the interstitial uh, edema will become greater. If we computer simulate this, you can see the more uh, colloid we give first, the greater uh, the, interstitial uh, the interstitial edema. And you may wonder, why, why do we have this? I believe there are two factors. I always believe that we do have some capillary leakage of uh, the colloid particles, whether it be in albumin, whether it be in starch, or whatever. We do have capillary leakage to the interstitium. And if, if we give an, a Ringer's acetate on top of that, of course it binds uh, Ringer's in the periphery. Also, we measure the, the oncotic pressure on, on this uh, uh, second infusion here, on the plasma samples, and we could see that there's a very uh, strong correlation between the increase in the colloid osmotic pressure uh, and the uh, 
prolongation of the elimination here of uh, the second crystalloid infusion. So, so this seems to be uh, this seems to be true. Actually, one would be believe that Volovene is iso-oncotic, but it's not. It raises the uh, plasma oncotic pressure. Now, this was an experimental study. Do we have any evidence of this colloid edema in um, uh, patients? Not, not much. I, I do have one study, a recent study, I would like to show here. It's a very small randomized trial, uh, but it was uh, uh, hysterectomies and there were laparoscopies and fluid given during surgery, not much, quite restrictive, but here 500 milliliters of colloid was given. We can see that during excretion during surgery it was actually better in the colloid group, but afterwards the postoperative urine volume was only half as great in the colloid group. And this could really implicate a, a late fluid retention based on the factors that I just talked about. But I would like to see more studies on the, on the edema caused by colloids, actually, because we focus very much on this with regard to crystallized, but colloids seem to be, have a, a, a prolonged effect. And it would be difficult to uh, get rid of this by just providing uh, diuretics. Okay, I will end up with some clinical views here. We'll take a look at the books again. We will have, uh, the light comes from Pittsburgh. We already know that today. This is Michael Pinsky has said this. Uh, what is the purpose to give fluids in intensive care? Well, we want adequate perfusion. That's what we want. Solely the focus on this. And how to do this? We use only in preload dependent patients. Okay, that means that if we expand the plasma volume by adding fluid, the heart must be able to pump a little more. It's more, not more complicated than just this. And when the end organ perfusion goals are not met, so we, he means that we should kind of detect an, an end organ um, perfusion failure or, or some evidence that perfusion is, uh, not, uh, is not optimal. A uh, few words about shock. We anesthetists tend to believe that shock is only hypovolemic. In hemorrhage, that's, uh, that's so. And as long as the autonomic system is intact, we can actually um, uh, see that fluids work very, very well to restore the situation. But we often have something else. We call it distributive shock. And that's very typical of sepsis. It's typical of... Uh, General anesthesia in general, actually, if you have a lower or if you have a reduced arterial pressure during general anesthesia, and well, problems with that, we're in a situation of uh, mild distributive shock. If you have a high spinal, also, that's the case. Here we have blunted the uh, adrenergic system, and um, fluids will alone will not work. What could be the the, the dangerous thing is we combine the two. So if we have a distributive shock and add on a hypovolemic shock, then the situation can, can be quite dangerous. I won't talk very much about that, just the very last words about fluid therapy during um, uh, the perioperative setting. We have three approaches. Uh, first, the one we use to the fluid balance method, we just add up the uh, perceived losses that we have and we substitute that. Outcome-oriented approach is my, my name. It's, a, it's the re result of many clinical trials where re uh, researchers have, com uh, have compared the outcome from giving this amount during this time with that one. And then we have learned a lot much more during the past 15 years of what we should use. And finally, we have goal-directed fluid therapy, which is an individualized approach based on hemodynamic goals. And of course, all of them have, have the goal here of, of uh, placing the patient that we call the sweet spot here in the middle, not being hypovolemic and not overloaded. Um, but as you see, it becomes a little difficult as we have a, a blunting of the autonomic system during general anesthesia as, as well. If we take the outcome-oriented approach, it has landed somewhere here, three to five milliliter per kilo per hour. 
Our computer simulated that and it allows for a hemorrhage of about one, 100 milliliters. So you don't need to change this if you have sort of minor hemorrhage. Two milliliters per kilo per hour actually increases the uh, likelihood of nausea postoperatively, which was shown in, in this, um, in this uh, review. Uh, article from the BJ a couple of years ago. Actually, the vomiting was alleviated if uh, additional uh, crystalloid fluid was given. Fluid overload adverse effects uh, are very well known from crystalloids, a little more poorly known from the colleagues, but uh, uh, that the first thing that, well, the, the um, adverse effects are, are very much dependent on where this crystalloid fluid ends up. And it ends up in the gastrointestinal tract, it ends up in the, in the skin, and it ends up in the lungs. So, so there we will have the overloading problems. Um, so if we have given three, four liters, something like that, we should think twice, maybe we'll have complication. If, if we give less than two liters, not very much happens, if anything at, at all. Uh, so let me conclude. Uh, the crystalloids distribution function, which we are helped by. We have a temporal arrest during induction of general anesthesia. So if you have a reduction of minotel pressure uh, during induction, everything will, what we infuse will remain in the blood for some time. A very effective plasma volume expander at, at that time. And then we have the urine excretion very low during general anesthesia. Interestingly, shortly after operation, the urine excretion is quite normal. So this is nothing that hangs on for a long time. It's just during this, uh, uh, this process of, uh, uh, of uh, a reduced mean arterial pressure. Collates uh, don't have a distribution phase, have half-life for two, three hours, at least in volunteers, what they have in uh, surgery. Probably the same, we don't know the details. What we have uh, during intensive care, nobody knows, <laughs> for worse. Uh, and uh, they will, um, crystalloid fluid will be poorly excreted after a uh, colloid. And uh, there may be a late postoperative uh, phase edema, which I would like to know more of. And with those words, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, give the words to the main speakers. Thank you very much. Um, we'll give them, the audience, some uh, time to uh, make some more questions, please. Please use the app. Uh, a, a quite common practice is to lower edema in, a, in surgery, during surgery and after surgery, by keeping the mean arterial pressure low. A lot of people do this, uh, but your finding is quite the opposite. Uh, what, you, what would you advise all these people trying to keep the mean arterial pressure do down? What would you advise, advise them to do? I, I think mean arterial pressure down would maybe reduce the bleeding, but, but not, the, uh, not the edema. <laughs> not the edema. Uh, actually, in, in this kinetic study, we infused it all, all over 30 minutes. It could be also be a, a volume dependency here, but we, we could only disclose this... Uh, this uh, rate. But mean of pressure low promotes edema, yes. I have a question about uh, giving fluid in shock. Yeah. It's a simple question, I think. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, adult intensivists always would say give 500 cc's or a liter or two liters. They would say the volume as an absolute amount. Yeah, yeah. But in part because of the Rivers trial, uh, which talked about 20 to 30 cc's per kilo, people started moving to weight-based algorithms. Mm -hmm. Now, the origins of that were because Manny Rivers was inspired by Joe Carcillo's guidelines from pediatric septic shock. Oh, yeah. And in pediatrics, everything is per kilo. When you give fluid in a shock state for an immediate expansion of the vascular space, mm -hmm. the traditional teaching is that adults have about a five liter effective yeah, yeah. volume. Extra, cell, extra vascular fluid is no doubt proportional to weight, mm -hmm. but is intravascular volume proportional to weight? Yes. 
Absolutely. So it's a, at, at least in the healthy human being. In a septic patient, you, you, ha you have a capillary leakage and you will have a certain degree of hy hypovolemia when you start treatment. So, That's what so 120 happens. kilo man has twice the vascular volume of a 60 kilo person. I, I, I don't know precisely what, what, what happens if we have very extreme body weights, but we surely have uh, equations from the beginning of the 1960s and also the 50s, where the plasma volume and the blood volume was correlated very closely to body weight and also uh, the height of the patient, but mostly body, body weight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now the audience has some very good questions. Um, as you well are aware of, uh, since you have uh, several publications of your own in goal-directed hemodynamic therapy, uh, the usual approach to that is by giving bolus, uh, bolus, fluid in bolus. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think a bolus is useful if you don't know if there is hypovolemia. Okay. Yeah, b because then you can detect an, an, an improvement of the hemodynamics. But if 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 you um, are not searching an answer to that question, I never think that the bolus is very wise to give. But if you have a very good answer, uh, but if you have uh, systems which can tell you beforehand if a patient is uh, volume responsive or not, we yeah. have some systems, uh, stroke volume variation and so on, yeah. uh, isn't, uh, what is it, uh, is it best to give a bolus quickly or should be just slowly, uh, slowly, slow. no bolus. It's a, a, the fluid uh, will have a less plasma volume expanding effect over time. It will press fluid into the interstitium to a greater degree, uh, and uh, and the elastic fibers will be more so changed by this. So the edema will be greater if you give it as a bolus. So, so my, my, my answer is, if you're not know, specifically uh, wanting to, to have an, uh, uh, an answer to if a patient is flu-responsive or not, it's not wise to give a bolus. Okay, but uh, very good answer. But if you know that the patient is hypovolemic, uh, you should... There's also a controversy between uh, keeping the patient hypovolemic, there will be underperfusion. Uh, so yeah, sure. If you know that the patient is hypovolemic, uh, then you can give it uh, quickly, faster, f faster, yes, because as, as fast, fast as as you would want to. Yes, because you suspect that in normal volemia there isn't that much of a leakage issue, or. I I didn't get your answer. If 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 we put it this this uh, this this way, uh, that you have a, a patient, you make him hypovolemic, and you give a crystalloid. You, you think that the majority of this fluid would stay in the circulation. No, it leaks as much too, actually. So uh, if, if you give it fast, you will, you will still have a peripheral edema. Uh, but of course, if you are uh, afraid of that these uh, clinical endpoints are not met, if you have acidosis or so, you must speed, speed it up. But you think that the situation is un under control. There's, there's no particular benefit of giving it very fast. From a kinetic point of view, it's better to give it slow. But if, if my, my answer would be, if you have a warning sign uh, that um, you have a patient with acidosis or you for some other reason would want to give the fluid fast, uh, then do it. But if you don't have that, try to, to give it a little more slowly. Uh, one more question from the audience. Uh, is it okay if I take yeah, sure. okay. yeah, I feel I'm taking over here. <laughs> uh, uh, there, there are some questions concerning that um, uh, colloid uh, increases uh, uh, peripheral edema uh, when you give crystalloid uh, yeah. as well. We always give both. Uh, what would you advise us to do in the clinic? <laughs> uh, I, I would say in the clinical situation, always start with the crystalloid and don't, don't start with the colloid. But if you run into uh, that you really need more plasma volume expansion before you get into the situation of giving erythrocytes and start to sort of uh, blood track 
uh, then you can consider a colloid if you are given if you are given three to four liters of a crystalloid, so that you are at risk of having adverse effects from the crystalloids. Uh, I, I think the adverse effects of crystalloids have been underemphasized. If, if you add up liters, 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 you will have problems. Mm. So it's, it's like with all drugs. If, if you, if you s have given so much of this one that you begin to have adverse effects from that, try to change to something else to, um, to make them summarize their beneficial effects, but try to keep the adverse effects as minimal as possible. Start with crystalloid and then later, if you, if you need, uh, give a, a call it. Actually, I've made computer simulations of this, and it shows that the therapeutic window for colleagues in, in hemorrhage during operations is quite small. So most often you are, are well off with a crystalloid all the way. Thank you very much.